we manage systems. Basically, systems are, are moved or changed through disturbance. And we can manage our systems by managing the scale of disturbance. Now, I think this touches directly on the question that was raised earlier about fire. Is fire good or bad? Well, it totally depends. It totally depends on what you're trying to achieve, right? Depends on how, how intense that fire is, how much fuel you have on the ground, what your objectives are, the frequency of the, of the, of the burn. All of that comes into play. But that, that's a good example of my point, which is that it's all about space, time, and intensity, or the magnitude of that disturbance. So if we get it right, if we put the right amount of animals on the right amount of land for the right amount of time, we can initiate this positive feedback process we're looking for. Now, I stole this concept out of a paper by Zev Nave, who <clears throat> he published in 1987 in Landscape Ecology in which he introduces general systems theory to landscape ecology. And, um, but I think it does a great job of illustrating. When I first saw this, the first thing that came to my mind was short duration grazing. And I was just like, boom, you know, wow, that somehow that, that connects somehow. And it took me about 25 years to figure out what the connection was. But, 23 years. Um, but basically, what, what this tries to show um, here is, is we've got grass growth, and then we have a grazing event. And we have grass growth, and a grazing event, and grass growth, and a grazing event. And if we're doing this right, if we get it right, if we hit that sweet spot, if you will, that we're going to allocate some of that carbon, some of that photosynthetic carbon, to the soil carbon pool. And it's this increasing soil carbon, of course, that we're looking for at this point. So it's all about scaling our system disturbances. So the question I bring back to range science and to range managers and to the conflict between the two is, does this explain why grazing systems do work sometimes and don't work sometimes? And does this resolve this, what's been really quite an acrimonious debate if you've been following the range literature, as I have for 25 years, um, be, uh, on this question of whether grazing systems work um, we, we've got a very strong academic contingent in California that says they don't. That rangeland variability simply exceeds the capacity of managers' ability to do anything about it. And meanwhile, we're seeing very positive results on the ground. So I, I'd suggest that our focus on carbon is not only appropriate and, and essential, but it also gives, it identifies the very indicator we need to use in order to monitor our systems for this positive feedback change that we need to initiate in order to reverse that Keeling curve. And this is the hypothetical effect of, of being successful in our efforts to do that. And if we can do this on a global scale with strategically scaled livestock impacts, there's no reason to think that we won't succeed. So what is next for the Marin Carbon Project? We're doing a, um, grazing trials now, and this is a, a rolling electric fence. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the tumbleville fence, but the cows love this thing. It, it, they line up behind it, and I move it steadily across the landscape, and they're always having a fresh bite of, of untrampled grass. Um, so we, we've got some data from the last couple years of the high grazing, high intensity grazing and uh, we have six plots on my ranch where I've got a control field and a, uh, what we're calling a mob grazing field where we, it's about 15 meter by 60 meter. And last year I put 42 animals for two hours in each of these cells. And, and, and over time we're watching the response in the soil system. And again here, we took soil samples to a meter and did a, a pretty thorough biomass mapping prior to and after these events. And this data is all waiting to be analyzed. Um, as you can see on this landscape, uh, it, I should have mentioned this earlier, my, my property was uh, dairy for 100 years until they put the reservoir next year next to it, and then from 1958 till when we bought it, it had been leased out to grazers, and at one point there were, were 300 animals on it year-round, and they just hammered it. So I've got a lot of repair work to do. That's, that's what you see above there. But, but before I started hanging out with PhDs, I was kind of messing around on my own. And what you see here on this slide, the, the 
odd patch in the middle was an experiment where I put four inches of compost down on my worst weed patch just to see what happened. And so now I have this location on my ranch where later we were to go in and break it up and we put a control on the left and then the grazing cell on the right and then on, to the far left we put another control and a grazing cell to compare what the composted area was to the native system. And, and we, as I said, we're still collecting all that data and it'll be really interesting to see. But what was really cool, when I started doing the soil samples on the area I had put four inches of compost down, I was finding roots down 30 centimeters. This blew me away. I, you saw that too, didn't you? That's, that's cool. It works. So um, we've, we've just been funded again through the generosity of the Marine Community Foundation to expand our research to include uh, looking at 35 years of projects in our area where the riparian corridor have been restored in terms of carbon. So we can go back to these sites now and, and look at what the carbon consequences of those projects have been. And um, we're doing the compost because of our results, we're now expanding out onto three local dairies in our area. We've got uh, compost and manure that we're putting out on three dairies in their pasture system to see what that looks like. And the compost is interesting. This is uh, corn. Now, we, our systems are C3 grasses. So what we have here, we, we brought corn stover in, and we're composting it by mixing it with certified organic dairy manure. And the C4 signature of the corn stover in the compost, we can now trace it isotopically through the soil system after we add that carbon. So we'll be able to follow the behavior of this. And back to weeds. Now, any of the weeds I do miss, I, I go out and I harvest the seeds and I compost them. And this, is a, this got up to 170 degrees after three days. So I'm doing a weed seed viability test. We'll, we'll try and germinate the weeds now that they've gone through that. So for me, I've gone through a personal growth where rather than hauling 240 cubic yards of this material to a landfill, I'm now looking at this as, as nutrient management. And, and because of what we saw with our research, we know that compost increases water retention in the soil system. So I'm, I'm managing my water, I'm managing my carbon, I'm managing my nutrients. And any questions? <laughs>